Hello and welcome to Commendable Commotion. I'm Matthew Tannum LG and I'll be talking to some fascinating people about some equally fascinating topics that need more commotion. Today I'll be talking to David Stockdale, creator and host of the YouTube channel Nightmare Masterclass. Nightmare Masterclass is a fascinating platform where David analyzes some truly original works of internet-based creative fiction, often by using scholarly theory. One of the great things about Nightmare Masterclass is that instead of summarising these works' plots or rehashing previous examinations of them by other people, David offers a truly unique interpretation of their content. In my conversation with David, you'll hear about how he got into starting Nightmare Masterclass, the types of projects he's analysed, how he creates his videos, and much more. So, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with David Stockdale. And as I said earlier, just I'm very interested in knowing, uh, you know, what is Nightmare Masterclass, if you would. It sounded interesting when you were describing it just earlier when we started talking about it. So, you know, for those unfamiliar, what is Nightmare Masterclass? Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, I think that is a question I sort of uh, neurotically deal with on a routine basis. The um, initial premise of the channel was taking uh, creepy stuff on the internet, ARGs, um, strange internet phenomenon, and uh, taking it extremely seriously from a critical standpoint um, for the purposes of kind of fostering a mentality of uh, questioning the society around us. Um, I started the channel in 2015, and um, over time, I think as with uh, as with everyone, um, I've sort of evolved over time, and now I'm having an existential crisis about what I want to do <laughs> moving forward. Um, I still, I still believe in the basic premise of of that project. Um, I guess I'm having some um I'm having some problems uh wrapping my mind around the best approach to take moving forward. Um it it has a lot to do with my presentation and um the specific methods I use to analyze all of these various things. Um you know, because I think initially when I started out. Uh, I did have a training, a sort of a liberal arts background. Um, I, I have an English degree. Um, so, and I, I did, my concentration was in um, theory, among other things. So I, that's, that's the training I have, at least at a rudimentary level. Um, and over time, I, I decided to try to integrate more and more of that into my into my approach. Um, so I've gotten a little bit heady, as they say. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know. Does that help? <laughs> Does that help it's, you understand? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I know what you mean that it's uh, sometimes difficult to kind of uh, get a grasp on what exactly you're doing in this moment with your channel or your podcast, etc. But it does it does give a good idea of how you started out doing it, as you said, like, you know, the horror projects and uh, the theory that you've uh, examined uh, in it. So I would be interested in knowing just like, you know, how did you start out doing that? Like what kind of inspired you or motivated you uh, to make Nightmare Masterclass in the first place? Oh, definitely projects um, like uh, along the, uh, the, the things that uh, people like Wham City Comedy were doing. And um so alan resnick specifically with alan tutorial um and this house has people in it um this house has people in it in particular i felt like was something that people were covering on youtube uh as a sort of like um it was a proof of concept to me that you could talk for a really long time about something that is like relatively niche and 
you could um, get a following. You could get an audience doing that. Um, and that really appealed to me at the time. Yeah. Yeah, Alan Resnick, he's an interesting one. Um, you know, he's been making things for a while now, and certainly it does kind of uh, get you thinking while at the same time being very mysterious and entertaining. So, yeah, no, I'm not surprised. Like, I mean, uh, so you mentioned you have a kind of liberal arts background. You have an English degree and you specialized in theory. Have you ever thought of going into academia, pursuing a career in academia at any point? Um, at all i've considered it at various points um i was strongly considering it when i was getting my bachelor's degree um at the time uh some of my uh friends um some people who were uh you know like my tas um kind of advised me not to do it just based on um certain economic realities at the time. Um, and I think those those realities have only, uh, it's only gotten worse, in other words, since I got my, um, I got my degree in 2006. Uh, so I was kind of discouraged from doing it. Um, mainly, um, mainly from the standpoint of you're, you're really not going to be able to support yourself doing it. Um, and I, I took that to heart. Um, yeah. I see. Um, would you ever consider it in the future or the near future? Would your decision ever change, no, in the future? Or I don't know, maybe it's difficult to tell. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough thing. Um, on one hand, I feel like going back to school at this point would be um something that would feel emotionally like a regression to me um but it's also subject to like academia changing radically i i feel like um i feel like there have to be more opportunities for people that not just like adjunct positions and stuff like that um, in order for me to seriously consider it, it is like in principle, um, the idea of getting paid to, uh, study this sort of thing and, uh, be able to talk about it, um, and, um, take it extremely, extremely seriously for a living, uh, that really appeals to me. I'm, I'm quite skeptical that it would work out for me if I pursued it at this point. That's the thing that's kind of preventing me from exploring that further. I see. Um, and in terms of like, you know, scholars and academics who would have inspired you and your work on Ma Nightmare Masterclass, because I know obviously there's uh, quite a good basis that you use uh, on your channel when you study particular works. Any you know, scholars or intellectuals in particular who would inspire you in combination with the, you know, more uh, artistic kind of practitioners, that kind of thing? Yeah, um, I'm not great with names. I feel like um, I, when I was studying, um, it, this was freshman year of college, um, I wrote a paper about uh, the ideological implications of fairy tales. And so I want to say that I was um, fairly inspired by, I want to say his name is uh, Zipes. Do you know who, who I'm speaking about? Uh, Frank Zipes? The the name sounds familiar, but... Yeah. You know. um, so uh, I had a very, um, I had a very encouraging professor at the time who was... Um, really really trying to get me to go down that rabbit hole um and um and that was uh that was just an introductory composition course that's the, the funny thing about it um so yeah um i i found that to be inspiring at the time um i've 
I've explored further. Uh, right now, I'm in the process of reading Frederick Jameson. Um, I've read the uh, Political Unconscious. Uh, I'm right now. I'm working my way through postmodernism, cultural logic of late capitalism, um, trying to uh, trying to maintain the um, the practice of reading slowly and carefully, um, which I found to be uh, pretty hard because I'm so used to like checking my phone and whatnot. Um, yeah. So um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else I would like to mention. Um, you know, that fellow who wrote Ways of Seeing, I can't remember his name. Um, Bergson? Is his name Bergson? Um, it, it might be. <laughs> yeah. I wish I knew as much as you do, to be honest with you. But uh, Bergson, have, the way you say it was, was it? I have his book over here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've... Ways of Seeing is a great book if you are uh, looking to get started out with uh, like uh, the analysis of art and um, thinking about it from a historical perspective. Uh, Ways of Seeing is a great book. Hmm. Thinking about it from a historical perspective. Okay. Um, and like, how did you like? Why did you, like, before we talk a bit about what you've examined specifically, why did you find it so useful in particular, that particular text? Um, I read it, let's see. I first read it, I think, junior year of college. And it opened up a whole world of possibilities for the, for the different possible ways you can analyze a piece of art um and and think about it critically um i i had a very like provincial upbringing i this is this was not something i i even thought was uh within the scope of possibilities is something you could potentially do you know um like an art criticism that my my dad was an iron worker um so I guess it was kind of a, a shock to the system, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It's um, sort of a, a paradigm shift in a way. Kind right, of. exactly. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, that's, no, that is pretty interesting. Um, so in terms of like, you know, some of the works that you've examined specifically, as you mentioned, a lot of them are horror-based. Um, I was just wondering, like, you know, subjectively, what do you find scary? Like, what sort of works scare you or, or sort of, um, you know, frighten you in, a, in an impressed way or in all sorts of different ways, negative or positive or both? Like, I mean, what sort of works particularly would you kind of look back on and say, like, wow, you know, that left a, an eerie impression on me, that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, things that scare me. Um, as a neurotic, I want to say that everything kind of scares me. Um, but when it comes to horror movies or or things along the lines of like uh the the stuff I cover on my channel, um what what really scares me is when a work comes um becomes like uncomfortably um uncomfortably close to something I'm dealing with personally um, in a way that, you know, obviously it's not the necessarily the intention of the person who created it, but maybe they're dealing with something similar or they're at least trying to convey a certain experience that is common to a lot of people. Um, I think it's almost become a cliche that like, uh, like elevated horror, um, is is the domain or territory of traumatic experiences right um that's almost become a cliche at this point but i think there is a certain truth to it um i remember the first time i watched hereditary uh directed by ari aster that 
um that in my opinion is like uh the the perfect execution of of the con that concept um having a sort of troubled family background where um you feel as though you may have inherited something something like a curse from your parents right um it's 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 like an artistic depiction of something that I think or feel like um, a lot of people deal with, right? Like they've inherited not only like genetic issues or whatever, but a certain baggage from their family. Um, so yeah, that's the type of stuff that scares me. Also, just like uh various depictions of of freak accidents scare me um because these are things that could just happen to anybody um so i know the, the you know like the final destination movies are really corny uh but they scare the hell out of me <laughs> yeah yeah i know what you mean i know what you mean it's um because like it's so subjective like you know what scares people in a work of fiction or non-fiction or whatever um a bit of both you know it's uh, it's interesting um and so would you find the the fear induced by things that are kind of more like that like that kind of final destination example and freak accidents or the more complex kind of um deep stuff what do you think ultimately is more useful in like you know when you're creating a work of fiction or whatever you know the the online horror projects which uh, you've examined which do you think is more effective um, in your view? It kind of depends on the context and um, what effect um, what effect you're going for, right? Um, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say that one is more effective than another in a vacuum. Um, it, it really depends on like, like I, I feel like, um, it, it is a bit uh, of a um, it's a pitfall to try to project what um, what the artist might be thinking or what their intentions are. Like, I, I do believe in the intentional fallacy and I, I believe in like the death of the author um, and and that that re we really shouldn't um, give that primacy in uh, when we're analyzing something. Um, but, you know, I do feel like when I watch something that is well executed, I, I understand the effect it's going for. I understand what the effect the work is going for. So like, you know, like I said, Final Destination, those are, those are corny movies. Um, I think the first couple perfectly, perfectly um execute the intended effect right um so if you judge it on those grounds it's highly effective um but it's you know that's not going to be it's it's not it's sort of like an apples and oranges situation when you compare it to something like uh like all these a24 movies that we we file under the header of elevated horror um that's just a whole other thing. It's it's not even geared towards the same audience. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, um, you know, for those unfamiliar, I heard you talk a bit about the whole concept of elevated horror with, um, I believe his name is the the Varn vlog. Uh, is that the name of the guy who uh, you did a podcast yeah. with a while ago? Yeah, Derek yeah. Varn. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Now, that was pretty interesting. Um, but just... For those unfamiliar, what do, you, what do you mean by elevated horror, if you would? It's definitely a can of worms, right? Um, I feel like the term itself is um, has has sort of gained a certain um, infamy. Like when you when you uh, talk about, and, and I'm like, I think part of it is I'm just really conscientious about various reactions to popular works on like film twitter i think when certain when uh, something gains a certain amount of traction there is 
necessarily going to be backlash and there's going to be like um people who legitimately um are sick of it and also people who are maybe a little bit contrarian like they just it's this is a popular thing so it, it it's um it's like aesthetically something not um aesthetically something that they are uh, like reflexively going to be um you know uh like like shitting on <laughs> for lack of a better word um like elevated horror is sort of a, it's a term that has emerged over the past couple years referring specifically to horror movies that it would seem have some kind of socio-political subtext and they're going for something. They have some kind of grander vision than um, like, and, and this is sort of my, um, my super ego talking when I say this, but they have a grander vision than like cheap thrills, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with cheap thrills um, if that's what you're going for. But there's this class of movies that try to do something a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more ambitious. When you explain things like this, people get a little bit defensive because um, because they like their cheap thrills. I do too. I like I like a like a corny horror movie as much as the next person. Um, I feel like Megan was along those lines. I, I recently watched Megan. I just felt like it was a corny um, kind of cheap thrill type horror movie that was extremely fun. And I think they they executed the concept perfectly. Um, maybe a few I, I would quibble with a few things here and there, but uh, I had a, I, it was a very enjoyable experience for me, you know. Um, but that's, you know. I wouldn't necessarily call it elevated horror. Um, it doesn't, there might be certain things it's going for in terms of uh, a little bit of subtext here and there, right? Um, but elevated horror is more associated with like Jordan Peele. Um, Jordan Peele would be the big one and Ari Aster would be another one. A lot of stuff that A A24 puts out. Um, stuff and it's, you know, the the problematic aspect of this now is that it's become sort of it's just a it's branding, right? A big part of it is just the way that um, the movie industry would like to uh, quarantine off movies that have this kind of socio political bent, this this uh, subtext, this really heady subtext. And uh, quarantine it off into its own thing, right? And so what's the function of that? Well, the sophisticated intellectual person is going to go watch it. So that's the demographic they're going for. Um, but it's all just a game, right? Like um, these these labels are kind of, uh, they can be a little bit superficial. Uh, but that's, as best I can gather, that's sort of the evolution, the background of of this term. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, you're right, I agree with you, um, but do you not think that um, sometimes people who, you know, maybe would just be interested in a horror film for being a, you know, critically acclaimed horror film, do you think, do you think some of those would, would flock to movies like that and that might be a, a demographic that might actually get reeled in as well or would that be less significant than the, the intellectuals? Yeah, these are just two different demographics of people. There's and there's some overlap. Like I'm I'm in the uh I'm in both categories. I like both, right? Um yeah, but they, you know, it's it's a different it's 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 a different audience that they're going for um when you put out a movie that's sort of like um I'm just trying to think of a few examples, you know. Um like I can't think of it. Um, 
like paranormal activities along those lines, you know, you'd be kind of hard pressed to say there's a whole lot going on there. Um, in terms of, in terms of any, any deeper thing that you can analyze, um, you might be able to, uh, you know, like, I'm sure there are perfectly good video essays about, um, uh, the paranormal activities franchise. Uh, but a- any kind of like inspection of that material, I think has to acknowledge that this is, this has become, uh, this has become a very like, uh, it's a commercial activity. It's a commercial thing that's going on here. Like this is a cash grab at a certain point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's, it's a pishy in a way it's a pishy. Um, but in terms of say, you know, um, good examples from what you've studied, what you've examined on your channel, what examples like would you say that you know over the years you've done nightmare masterclass what examples particularly stick out to you of uh these sort of you know um online horror or you know any horror in general any work of fiction that you've examined um that sticks out to you even to this day as being particularly impressive or one of them at least uh pet Scott would have to be at the top of the list i think it's probably my all-time favorite online horror series um maybe my favorite horror work of horror you know um so petscop is definitely up there uh for those of you who don't know what that is it's um it is a web series on youtube about a fictional video game um so i don't want to spoil too much if you haven't heard of it check it out I couldn't agree more. Petscop, uh, you know, it, it is brilliant. And that brings me to a question I did want to ask you particularly. Um, things like Petscop and other things that you've analysed, like the uh, the beta archive one, the Super Mario 64 beta archive, they they tend to incorporate an element of, you know, like online impersonation. Um, so it all becomes a bit of a, you know, sort of play acting or, you know, for want of a better word. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on the idea that like works like Petscop? Because obviously, you know, for those unfamiliar Petscop, uh, no spoilers, obviously, but Petscop is, um, you know, in the form of like a vlog, essentially, yeah. almost, or, you know, a let's play kind of a thing. Um, but similar to a vlog or something where, you know, it is kind of like it's some casual uh, sort of, you know, channel for curious subscribers, uh, you know, this guy playing this mysterious video game he found, and it all goes uh, creepy and eerie and disturbing from there. Um, But obviously, given the strong element of, like, you know, impersonation, acting kind of in it, because it is acting, would you say that works like that are kind of like almost like a, a new form of performance art or something like that or you know some sort of mediatized performance um you know it's an area that i personally am delving into in my studies so i'm just wondering what are your thoughts on that idea that they incorporate all these elements of performance um in a new way with the internet right i absolutely i yeah i wholeheartedly agree with that um the the thing that you know continually fascinates me is is uh, all of these different creative ways in which people employ different um different mediums different platforms on the internet um and like they can be totally disjointed in certain ways like you can use twitter you can use youtube um and leave it up to the audience to piece things together um and all of these different aspects can kind of uh form into a cohesive unity even though it's like it could be maybe maybe there's certain different aspects of this uh web series there's a website there's a youtube channel maybe there's 
maybe there's a couple of YouTube channels, depending on like what's going on with the story. Maybe there's different characters with different YouTube channels. Maybe there's different characters with different Twitter profiles or different Facebook profiles or, you know, uh, the, there's such, um, there's such potential there, um, for novel ways of storytelling. Uh, so that's, that's really what, um, piques my interest. There is a lot of potential there. Yeah, I agree with you. And, um, in terms of say, you know, um, why do you think these works don't receive as much attention academically or otherwise compared to like, you know, works of literature, um, you know, film, television, etc. Why do you think these works, which, you know, have, as your work shows, are worthy of study in their own right, um, from a theoretical or, you know, from a scholarly perspective, why do you think they don't receive as much attention? That's a good question. Um, they are less easily commodifiable uh, by definition because they're less accessible. They require a certain amount of work um, for the audience in order to figure out what's going on. Um, and so by definition, they are going to be less popular because less eyeballs, there's less people looking at it. Um, I think in, in the realm of academia, it's starting to become an area of interest. And, um, you know, people like you, I've heard other people uh, approaching this from a scholarly perspective. Um, you know, people contact me here and there and they, and they say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm studying this in school. I think that's really cool. Um, that's that's awesome. And uh, so, yeah, I think uh, I think the int intellectuals are starting to pick up on why this is so interesting. Um, as far as like the mainstream, I would be hard pressed to say that anything along these lines is ever really going to become mainstream um because it just it just requires a bit more work to unpack than your average um than your average movie than your average horror book right um and there's a limited amount of time in the day people have to work people have to support themselves so um they don't necessarily have time to figure out what's going on in this other, this whole other fictional universe that somebody created. Um, but if you do have time, it can be very rewarding, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, what sort of like, you know, the relevance in your opinion of um you know, scholarly theory to some of the works you've examined. Um, would you be able to, you know, in a nutshell, basically describe how academic theory would fit into, you know, projects you've examined, like, you know, Petscop or um, that one called Hiding in My Home, which you examined? Uh, that one's a lot of fun. Back. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I can't remember the uh theory elements that you put into that particular analysis if any it may have been a more general overview i can't remember um but the basically would you be able to describe you know how academic theory fits into these sorts of projects for those for the uninitiated yeah um honestly my approach is sort of a non approach um so when i um when I am engaging with a work, I tend to do a, a sort of free association um, with other things that are of interest to me at that time. Um, so I think in the in the case of Hiding in My Home, um, I was reading Culture of Narcissism by an author named Christopher Lash. And I thought it was quite interesting how there was a there was a kind of thematic overlap, or at least what I perceive to be a thematic overlap. I'm often accused uh, by various people 
uh, on my channel of kind of like reading too much into things or um, maybe inserting my inserting my my uh, po politics into areas where it doesn't belong. Um, I I don't really think it works like that. I think no matter how like no matter how you approach something uh, along these lines, it is going to be. Uh, an ideological endeavor because we can't really escape ideology. It's it's uh, part of our it's how we make sense of the world. Um, it is, um, you know, I guess to put it plainly, like I the way I understand ideology is like how do you think the world works? Um, so everyone has a theory about how the world works. Um, even if it's it's a malnourished theory, even if it's like underdefined and it's not really something they've thought about very much, they operate with certain ideological predilections. Um, and and that is going to reveal itself um, when they talk about the movies they like, when they talk about um, if they're a big fan of ARGs. And how they understand and interpret that ARG is going to be revealing in certain ways, because the more you try to repress ideology, the more it can rear its ugly head in awkward and unintentional ways. Um, so, you know, that's that's sort of um, a long way of saying that um, when I approach something, um, I I really am like what what am I interested in in this present moment um and like I said I do a form a sort of free association I just kind of um try to relate it to things that I'm studying you know Right, right. And it works. Uh, it works quite well uh definitely from what I've seen from your channel. So in terms of like, you know, how do you think these, you know, works that you've examined, um, you know, as I said, Petscop hiding in my home, the uh, <laughs> the Super Mario 64 beta archive. Um, how do you think that, uh, you know, maybe other people can start looking at them from, you know, a sort of academic lens Um uh, like you and I do. How how do you think people can start doing that if anyone is thinking of doing that as well? That's a good question. Um, I think there is no easy answer. Um, my my sort of gut, my instinct would be to tell people to don't try to force it. Um, you know, um, try to read more and. Uh, read things that are interesting to you um and if you in your head you're like oh you know watching this watching this web series makes me think of this concept then try to unpack that and just take it one step at a time um but yeah it's i'm not going to say there's no one size fits all solution. I think, and depending on what you are engaging with, what you're watching, uh, that might lend itself towards uh, something that you're not really interested in right now for whatever reason. Um, so don't try to force it. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of just comes naturally then when you're kind of, um, you know, like it just sort of spontaneously is like, well, you know, here's this particular web series you're watching or this particular film that you're watching or book. Um, and essentially it's sort of like, um, oh, well, this particular thing I studied in college or I'm studying in college, you know, it applies seamlessly, that kind of thing. And then it just kind of goes from there. And um, maybe that's a good example as well, as you know. Right. I'll give you an example of something. Um I am currently in the process of uh, trying to analyze this new web series. Reminds me in a lot of ways of Petscop, but it has its own uh, it has its own unique flair 
that I find to be very interesting. It seems to be a little bit more concerned with geopolitics in a way that is confusing to me, um, sort of confounding. And uh, it's hard to talk about in the abstract. You'll, you'll get what I'm talking about if you watch the video that I come out with next. But um, explore things that are confusing to you. That's that's some advice I would say. If if something is like, if something is like making you feel like the world doesn't make sense anymore, or if uh if there's something that is kind of just throwing you off, um, oftentimes the knee jerk reaction to that sort of feeling is to ignore it or try to avoid it, try to repress it, try to think about things that make sense, right? Um, cause that's a little bit more comforting. Um, but the advice I would, I would say is like, live in that moment, be uncomfortable and try to explore it and try to figure out what's going on. Why does it make you feel uncomfortable? Um, yeah, so this, um, this, this work I'm analyzing currently, uh, I said before, it, it makes me, um, it seems to be broaching the, the topic of geopolitics, uh, specifically like uh, post World War II, in a way that, um, in a way that just sort of blows me away, and I'm just like, what, what is the message here? Is there a message, or is this, are or are these references just sort of random? Um, yeah. And I've, I've sort of come to the conclusion or I've made the connection. Well, this almost kind of reminds me of um, this also almost kind of reminds me of like a realist perspective. Um, and, and when I say realist, I don't mean like uh, literary realism. Um, I mean, like uh, a realist understanding of geopolitics. That is to say, like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this sort of school of thought, but it's it's sort of a a form of uh, it's like a, the study of international relations from a perspective that attempts to kind of remove moral considerations from what's going on and just strictly focus on um, how power is consolidated uh, across the across the world over history and try to try to form an analysis based on on that instead of moralizing uh, that's what it sort of reminds me of so you know that's a long way of saying like this is a this is a connection it may or may not be tenuous <laughs> um but it's something that it's something that i was thinking about when i i watched this yeah and when you've analyzed things like, you know, uh, I know you did a very good analysis of uh, the TV series uh, and movies, uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Mm -hmm. um, and you came up with, uh, you know, links to Kierkegaard. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, the sickness unto death and uh, all those sorts of ideas. Were they... So presumably, like, I mean, were, were they, you know, writings and ideas that you were familiar with beforehand? And when you watched a series like that, you kind of thought, ah, you know, after analyzing it, I see the connection here. Or is it like you watched it first, then kind of went looking for stuff that you thought could link? I mean, it's not, maybe it was the former, no? Uh, it's a little of column A and a little of column B. Um, so when it comes to Neon Genesis, this, the thing there is that, like... Um, I watched this series uh, quite a while ago, and then I kind of uh, watched it again. Um, the impetus for that was that it it, it came back on Netflix, um, or it was added to Netflix. So I, I rewatched the whole series, and then I watched the movies again, and um, kind of rekindled my love for it. Um, but you know, I was familiar with Kierkegaard before. Uh, and specifically the concept of the sickness unto death. Um, and I think um, 
I think I had this vague notion that it was something that something that the show is grappling with, uh, maybe, you know, not, not consciously. Right. Um, but there's some, there's some thematic overlap there. There's some, uh, generative discourse to be had there. And, um, and, and so then that prompted me to kind of explore it a little bit further and actually read Kierkegaard. What's your uh, editing process like? Because I remember that video you made on that series in particular. And, you know, it was interesting the way you put it together visually. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you go about doing that, uh, you know, in your, in your experience? So you're talking, are you asking about the video editing? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I try to think about what is within the scope of my abilities and my budget, which is zero. <laughs> and, um, and I try to think about what would be, what would be like a thematically interesting way to convey this information? Um, you know, perhaps in a way that uh, relates to the work in some way. Um, sometimes I make like little inside jokes that only if you're a really big fan of the of the work that you're going to get. Um, and for Neon Genesis, I I was sort of I I, I seem to remember at that moment I was kind of grappling with. Um, it seemed a, a lot of it is just kind of trying to predict what the algorithm is going to like. Um, that's part of it too. So at that time, I was kind of grappling with like, um, you know, some sometimes I make these videos, I'm on camera and I'm talking. Sometimes I just uh, have something. Um, I just play scenes from whatever I'm covering. Uh, sometimes it's a little of both. And I was, I'm trying to figure out what people like. I'm trying to figure out what is the most engaging way to present this information. Um, yeah, these are all things that I, I'm trying to, trying to think about. Good, good. Yeah, no, and it works. As I said, like it works, and um, you know, it's good how you obviously put a lot of thought into the visual component and the communicative component, as well as the you know textual component or the, uh, you know theory component um you know another piece of media which you've um analyzed that was very interesting actually uh was uh, the, the paranormal paranoids uh yeah. i believe that's being made into a film uh, right. at the moment uh yeah so back when it was kind of like a you know sort of web series kind of thing and you know utilizing twitter uh, as i said there was kind of a performance element to it now that i think about it for sure yeah yeah. What exactly, like, you know, um, how exactly did you deduce this, you know, that there could be the sort of message that you sort of uh, communicated in your analysis of the series? How did you, you know, deduce that that might have been going on? Um, you know, did it take a while? Because I, I know it was a very, uh, you know, good reading on it. Um, you know, so I'm just, I'd be interested in knowing how did you come about with that sort of reading of it? Anytime, um, anytime there's a series where there are multiple different components of it, like in this case, in this case, it wasn't too, um, it wasn't too complicated. There's a, 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 a video component on YouTube and then there's like this social media component on Twitter. And I, as I recall, I mean, this was a while ago, but um, I remember, I seem to remember that there were multiple characters on Twitter as well. So anytime there are multiple components like that, um, the first thing I do is I just watch watch all the videos and I, I kind of casually um, just take a look at Twitter and see what's going on, see if there's uh, some general some general uh, narrative arc that I can discern. Sometimes it's not so easily discernible. And uh, if there are any kind of uh, general themes going on. And 
um, I think it's kind of important to just passively um, passively uh, engage with the work at first and just kind of get an overall sense of, of the vibe it's going for. And then if I decide, hey, this is really interesting, I, I think there's some uh, good territory to explore here. Um, then I get a little bit more systematic in my approach. And then I say, I'm going to, I'm going to try to map out everything that's going on. And, um, the way that I do that, it, it, it depends on, it depends on how many components there are. It depends on how complicated it is. But in general, what I do is I just have a spreadsheet. Um, I have a spreadsheet with all of the different elements of that work that I can discover. Sometimes I miss things. Sometimes I, I don't find a website. That's a that's a critical oversight on my part, right? Um, but I try to uh, take an inventory of all the different elements of the work. And, and then that gives you a little bit more space to dig, dig deeper. And um, if you have particular questions about a certain aspect of it, you can go back and you had you got your spreadsheet there, you got a column for the notes, and you can be like, I just want to index this. I want to index this thought I had here. Um, it helps you keep track of your thoughts. Um, and then once you have a more thorough understanding of the work, then it's time to start your first draft and and try to um, you know, knock out a few thousand words, right? Um, so yeah, that's basically my approach and it really depends on how complicated it is. Sometimes like, obviously if I'm just talking about a movie, I don't do any of this. I just watch the movie a couple of times and then I, I write about it, um, which is a fine approach too, but you know, um, some of these more complex, uh, ARGs and web series, they, they demand a more thorough inspection. They do, they do. And, you know, part of the reason for that may be because of the sort of audience interaction element of it, mm -hmm. uh, which does kind of draw some interesting parallels between uh, these online projects and, you know, more traditional theatre, you know, staged theatre, all that kind yeah. of thing. Uh, it's interesting when you think about it. Um, and so, you know, given the popularity that... Um, both Petscop and your analysis of Petscop have received um, over the years. Were you able to describe, like, I mean, you know, um, what do you think the impact of, say, Petscop itself has been on kind of online horror web series, online performance art, um, first of all? And, you know, what do you think the, you know, the impact on yourself or on other people, that kind of thing, on your work of your analysis of, of Petscop is, uh, I know that's kind of two in one, but I was just wondering, like, what do you think the yeah. impact overall of Petscop is? Because obviously, as you said, it's very an inspirational work for people unfamiliar with this kind of medium. Uh, so what would you what would you make of all that? Yeah, um, it is pretty obvious at this point that Petscop has been uh, highly influential on particular creators. And um, I, I think that's only going to be more and more the case um, as it kind of, uh, as, as the blood vessels try to uh, start to get more rigid, um, you know, like, it's it's definitely still an extremely niche thing but um and it's it's a little bit inaccessible compared to your average uh tv show or horror movie so i don't i don't think pet scup is ever going to be like a mainstream thing that everybody it's going to be like a household name or anything like that but 
there's a there's a damn good chance that it might influence someone who makes like a an extremely popular movie um i think that's you know i think there's a, a that's a pretty good likelihood at this point um so it's its influence is going to be subtle um but there's no doubt in my mind that it's made an impact. I think it's kind of um, inspired a whole, a whole, uh, I, I want to call it a genre, um, but I'm not sure if like formally uh, it can be classified as a genre, but you know, just the idea of a fictional video game, right? I think that that existed prior to Petscop, but Petscop really executed that concept in a way that, um it's it proves to me that there is such potential here to tell um to tell a really complex story um and maybe maybe even uh that's misleading um cuz it it's not so much that it's telling a story it's that it's it's conveying um like an emotional experience uh, in artistic terms um a lot of the elements of the story are really open ended um so yeah um that's a as far as its overall influence but as far as its influence on me um yeah like i said it, it really just proves to me um how far you can take this and the really exciting thing is that Petscop has kind of set the standard and now you're going to have artists who try to push it a little bit further and they get a little bit more experimental and that's really exciting. And so I agree with you. And so like, you know, I, I completely agree with that. And on that note, like, you know, what sort of projects are you going to be analyzing next? I understand you may not want to give too much away. Um, but, you know, are they similar to, I know you mentioned one that is kind of in a similar vein to Petscop. Yeah. Um, so in addition to that, like, are you, you know, what sort of things can we look forward to seeing from you next? Um, I'm flying by the seat of my pants right now. So I am, uh, I have the next video planned out, but aside from that, I'm, uh, I have no idea. I don't have any long-term plans. I think, um, I think I kind of told myself at the beginning of this year that I was kind of going to try to get back to my roots. Um, going to try to um, really stick the, stick to things that uh, evoke, evoke a reaction in myself, um, like a strong personal reaction and try not to be so, um, I think I have a tendency to get a little bit detached um, and and uh, it's kind of like the veneer of intellectualism. Um, it's it's like a defense mechanism because I don't like talking about myself. Um, so, I, you know, at the beginning of this year, I told myself I'm going to try to stop doing that so much. It reminds me of, uh, is it in Sein Seinfeld, or am I thinking of a different series where there's a conversation about that, where the guy's sort of intellectualizing uh, what's happening to someone else, and it's because, well, this is because, you know, it's happened to you, you know, and um, it's a similar kind of process, you know, um, and I can see what you mean, like, sometimes when you see that happening, it is kind of like, you know, well, you know, let's... Uh, look inward as such and let's be honest kind of a thing but that is a great explanation uh, so it's exciting stuff what you're coming out with and uh you know i personally am looking forward to more of it and many other people are too one more question and it's an important question you know what advice would you give to people who want to get into what you're doing you know making video essays making uh, the sort of work that you do. Um, what advice would you give them when they're just starting out or at any stage of the journey? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, there's a lot of advice I could give right now. Um, the first thing I would say is um, that you, you're you going to have to try 
and I know it's difficult, you're going to have to try to develop very thick skin um, because putting your stuff out there into the world is um, especially on a platform like YouTube or however, whatever um, social media platform you want to use. Um, you know, you, you know, there's people who go on Twitch. Um, you are going to uh, run into all types of people and some of them are not mentally well. <laughs> um, so be prepared for that. Um, have a general understanding of set boundaries for yourself. Um, tell yourself, okay, this is this type of behavior I'm not going to engage with. Um, you know, maybe if someone is, maybe if someone disagrees with you, but they're being civil and you can tell that they are not totally insane, um, then, you know, maybe you can have a back and forth with that person. Uh, but set boundaries for yourself because you can get wrapped up in the most ridiculous, time-wasting, inane conversations. Um, and it, after a while, it'll make you not want to engage with your audience. And that's, you don't want that. Um so set boundaries for yourself. Be prepared to receive all types of criticism. Some of it will be constructive. Some of it will be just personally insulting. And don't engage with that stuff. You don't need to. Um, it's a waste of time. Uh, so that that would be uh, one piece of advice I would give because I do I do think it's important to consider like the psychological toll of having a following um of a certain size i think it takes like i i have some experience with it but um people who have a bigger platform than me probably deal with it a little bit more so i, I only really have a taste of it right um that is something like if you are going to put your stuff out there be prepared for that. Have have a plan in your head for how you're going to deal with certain different types of criticism. Um, yeah. And um, aside from that, I would just say um, try not to be try not to be too hard on yourself. Um, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has a bad take here and there. I've had more than a few bad takes in my life. It's an understatement. Um, so, um, you know, I try to I try to have a basic. Um, I try to keep in mind that if I'm if I'm somewhat um, if I'm somewhat embarrassed or it makes me cringe, uh, something that I said like a few years ago, uh, that means I'm learning and that means I'm growing, right? So if you if you've had um if you've made mistakes in the past or if you've had like just a just a, a mindset that's not conducive to um lucid analysis, um don't be too hard on yourself. The fact that you are self-aware, the fact that you are conscious of that means that you are uh, at the very least like an introspective person who wants to be better. And that is, you know, that, that can make all the difference. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, those are wise words indeed. Yeah, no, and I'd, I'd agree with that. And, um, you know, it's very true. It's uh, accurate and true. Uh, I think that is about it, but it's been incredibly informative. Uh, so thank you very much. And where can people find you? You know, where do you want to direct people to, to, you know, find your work and uh, all the things that you do? Yeah, you can find me on youtube.com uh, forward slash nightmare masterclass. 
You can find me on patreon.com forward slash nightmare masterclass. Um, those are the two main ones. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, well, in terms of then, uh, you know, uh, let's see. One little last question. Um, sure. What sort of, um, you know, what exactly, you know, your uh, analysis, let's say, uh, whether it's on Petscop or anything else, um, what impact do you do you hope to have on viewers, uh, whether or not they're, you know, thinking of creating their own analyses of uh, certain works? What impact do you hope to have on them? Um, I have a very low bar. Uh, I feel as though, as if you if if you have taken something useful from any one of my videos, um, mission accomplished. I, I try not to have too many expectations about this sort of thing because i'm i'm well aware that like the influence that media has on people uh in terms of affecting real change in terms of affecting their actions their behavior um that whole connection is kind of dubious at best like it's not well established um so I'm really happy. I'm really happy when people tell me that like something I said helped them understand a concept better. Um, or um, when people tell me that like I have uh, exposed them to something that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. That's those are the two major things for me. Very good, very good. And, uh, you know, I can assure you there's been plenty of that and uh, more to come as well. There's definitely uh, a lot of that on your channel uh, and on your podcast as well. Uh, Nightmare Tonight. Yeah, um, thank you. Called. Yeah, yeah, that's a good podcast. Um, any new episodes of that coming out soon by any chance? Been on hiatus for a little while now. Um, I, um, I'm tentatively considering doing something a bit later in the year um trying to line up a few more guests and um it's it's uh it's something that's fun for me there's there's really um i do enjoy like a, having conversations like this um so it's it's you know personally fulfilling and um yeah so i'm going to try to do more of it good stuff good stuff well uh, have a good evening or afternoon i believe it's uh heading into evening where you are it now. is yeah well uh thank you very much indeed and uh have a good day yeah thank you